Here in Sri Lanka, missiles regularly rain down on us. They bring injury and even death to anyone unfortunate enough to find themselves in the firing line. They seem to come from out of the blue, but a closer look up into the palm trees reveals the truth. Though I'm always on the lookout for killer coconuts, one of them almost brained a member of my film crew a few years ago, I'm far more interested in stranger aerial bombardments. For example, showers of fish, rains of frogs, and falls of weird jelly. Where do they come from? Well, it's a question I've tried to answer before. Just before she hit it, a fish fell down on the ground in front of us. And then we looked up in the sky, and suddenly there were hundreds of fishes falling in an area of about 100 yards. I saw the fish, saw the fish fall out of the sky. I kept driving. I was very amazed. And when I got here, at this location here, the yard was just absolutely covered with fish. Looking around, we found they were in the middle of a shower of hazelnuts coming from the sky. They were dropping on the cars falling in the gutter, and I should think there would be as many as we saw, about 350 of them. It sounded like the ceiling all fell in on, on my house. We looked up the ceiling and we saw uh, insulation and ice falling down on the floor, which flew all over us. We had no idea where it came from, but it was sure in a hurry to get here. That first investigation reached no definite conclusions, so I make no apology for returning to this intriguing subject. More than half a century after the most extraordinary experience of his life, Ron Newton is still haunted by the day thousands of fish fell on him and his girlfriend. I was about 15 year old and my girl, uh, Ivy Crouch, she was 16 and uh, as we were walking down the chase, we saw this cloud about the size of a billiard table to us. It came lower and lower. We run under a big old tree. And by the tree was a cottage. Now, we hadn't been under the tree long when there was a, a rattly noise up in the branches and there was fish coming down. St uh, about the size of sticklebacks, white bait inch to three inches long but they were coming down on the cottage roof and sliding down the roof and falling off onto the path well ivy was crying about it because of the poor little fish were flipping about helpless and we found an old shoe box but there were too many fish for the shoe box the rescue attempt overwhelmed them Suddenly, a romantic walk had turned into something sinister. Amidst the flapping fish, Ron and Ivy struggled to make sense of what was happening to them. There were so many thousands of fish on the ground all round. What we did wouldn't notice, so we gave it up. And we were scared about it. We didn't know quite what was going to happen. In the heart of the south of England, Derek Gosling's home in Surrey stands in a county far from the sea. His garden is his pride and joy, but one morning he was startled to discover a mystifying crop. It had been a very stormy night and uh, I came out the following morning to see what damage had been done and I noticed fish on the pathway, which was rather puzzling. And I looked round and I saw more on the ground and two on the roof of the lean-to, and various fish spread about the garden, two in the rose bushes, just hanging in the rose bushes, and more scattered on the lawn and under the bushes, and uh, I couldn't make out where they had come from. I looked round to the other gardens to see if they had anything, you know, because I thought someone was having a joke at the time, and I couldn't see any more and uh, it was rather puzzling, so I called the wife and uh, she came out and had a look. She was as puzzled as I was. 
I must say that they were smelling at that time, so they must have been out of the water for a few hours at least. And uh, as there's no major rivers from the southwest, I can only assume that they come from the sea. I've always suspected that tornadoes or water spouts may be the main causes of such weird falls. For example, when a tornado passed through the Brahmaputra district of India in March 1875, a cow was found in the branches of a tree about 30 feet from the ground. After a storm in America in 1943, dozens of chickens were found sitting in a row, entirely stripped of their feathers. But my favorite comes from 1896. At St. Louis, a whirlwind lifted a carriage into the air. It was carried along for 100 yards before floating back to earth so gently that the coachman's hat stayed firmly on his head. And in more recent times, tornadoes and whirlwinds have continued to play extraordinary tricks. America's West. Here, where Texas joins Oklahoma and the wide open spaces seem to run on forever, they call it Tornado Alley. More tornadoes like this one in 1957 are born here than anywhere else on Earth. And the tricks they play can be devastating, ripping whole communities from their roots. Sometimes they sweep everyone in their path high into the tempestuous sky. Today, Kenneth Harrell is returning to his childhood home as a grown man, a stark contrast to the strange and dangerous journey he once made here as a baby. Forty years on, his older sister, Jean Stray, waits for him, full of memories. Hello, love. Hello, Jean. How you doing? It's been a long time. It's been a long, long time. Well, honey, this is where it took place. So this is it? This huh? is it. 47 years ago. Kenneth was the baby of the family. He and his sisters had enjoyed a quiet day at home. It was in the afternoon, about 6 or 6.30, and Mother was cooking dinner on this great big wood-burning stove. And all of a sudden, there was a loud roar. And about that time, I was standing behind Mother, and I saw the grove of trees, and the tornado and the trees just being picked up like toothpicks and laid down. The tornado was about half a mile to the horizon. Mother then got us all, all four of us children, into where the bed area was, because we lived in one room, put us on the mattress, me, my sister, my other sister, and then put Kenny on my tummy, tucked the covers in underneath us. And by the time the tornado had hit the house, we were losing our oxygen. And I remember mother standing over us, and I said, Mother, quit moving the bed. She said, Honey, I'm not moving the bed. At that moment, the tornado struck. The whole family was lifted into the sky. And when I came to, I was underneath these tree branches. And the girls I saw over there by the fire come and pulled me out. And I looked and looked and called for Kenny. I'm sure that I was screaming his name, Kenny, where are you? And it was about 100 yards away is where I found him under the bedstead. He was like a little mud ball that I'd picked up from underneath the gate. He was unconscious and blood everywhere. And the mud was in his hair and his eyes and his face. You could hardly make him out as a baby. The tornado roared on, shattering the nearby communities of Glazier, Canadian, and Higgins. Back on the ground, seven-year-old Jean was frantically searching for the rest of her family. The tornado must have carried us 100 feet in the air and just the mattress turned over and just let us come down together like a parachute. And not being able to find Mother was the most terrifying thing of all. Early the next morning, they found Mother at the horizon. She had fell on one of the tree stumps that was uprooted and broke her back, all of her ribs, her arms, a broken up body. Miraculously, Jean's mother did survive, but the village itself was virtually blown off the map. Glacier was completely destroyed, and as was Higgins, there was nothing there. It was 
it was leveled. And the only thing that survived was, looked like a little nine by 12 cement jailhouse. Such tales don't in themselves solve the mystery of these peculiar falls, though they do provide valuable leads. Proof that whirlwinds are responsible demands eyewitness evidence that fish can be sucked out of ponds like this one and blown across the country. I found reliable reports impossible to obtain until now. One of the most convincing accounts of a liftoff from a pond comes from a man in the north of England who was out one day for a walk with his children. New houses today fill the space once occupied by a fish pond. Every time Ernie Singleton walks past, he relives the moment when he feared all that he loved would be snatched from him. I was walking along with my two children, going home, just where these houses are now, and I felt a, a wind blowing up. It was quite strong, very blowing up the road. And I thought, oh, that's funny, it's time of the year, very wind blowing. And I walked a bit further, it got stronger and stronger. And it started going a little bit dark. I thought, the devil's happening here, is it me? And the kid says, what's the matter, Dad? I said, no, oh, nothing, it's all right. And then I reached this spot, and where the houses are, there was a big pond, which had been a clay pit. And the wind got so strong that I was afraid of it blowing the children into the road, so I pushed them on the floor and lay on top of them. And I clung onto the fence with one hand and over the kids with the other. And as I looked at the pond, all the water was going out of the pond and going upwards. It was spiraling up into the air and all going black and dark. I was terrified. I could feel it tugging at my clothes because I only had some of clothes on which were loose. There must have been thousands and thousands of gallons went up out of the pit because it was almost emptied. And as I got up, little bits of things lying on the road here and it was some of the fishes out of the pit. It wasn't till later that day that the community discovered where their pond and its contents had made landfall. A mile away, the cricket ground was awash with water, weeds, fish and frogs. Ernie Singleton had witnessed the awesome power of a localised whirlwind. He had seen the lift-off of an entire pond. Oh, it was the talk of the town. It was buzzing for about nine days, or nine days' wonder. The fish were no good. They were all dead, of course. So they were used as manure. Where falls of fish are concerned, I'm quite happy with the whirlwind explanation. But can the same apply to the showers of frogs reported from all over the world? I think that for these, there may be a different answer. No one knows more about frogs than Dr. Richard Griffiths. From his university at Canterbury in Kent, Griffiths travels the world in search of slimy specimens. He studied their habits and their habitats, and he's investigated reports of weird showers of frogs and toads. He believes eyewitnesses are seeing a rarely observed natural phenomenon. It appears paranormal, but it can be explained by science. A number of species, particularly uh, the common toad, which we have in this country, are what we call explosive breeders, and they breed very quickly in a very short period of time en masse. Very often, warm, damp weather acts like a switch, and you get a mass, what we call a mass metamorphosis, of very young individuals leaving the pond, and they emerge from their hiding places, and you can see, again, very large numbers of tiny little frogs or toads wandering around on land. So literally, a lot of people might live in an area where there are many frogs and toads and not see any one day, but if the weather conditions change, the following day there may be very large numbers around. Frogs live in communities of huge numbers, up to 15,000. When rain triggers them, they emerge from their hiding places and often seem to have fallen with the raindrops. But Dr Griffiths also has another explanation for the falling frog phenomenon. I had an interesting experience when I was on a field trip in Austria. We were doing some work around a lake and we decided to break for lunch. And I was sitting under a tree eating my sandwiches when literally a frog fell into my lap. Um, when I picked it up, I looked at it and this turned out to be a European tree frog. 
And in this particular area, this species was actually very, very abundant. So if you're in that sort of situation, very often, if you've got them jumping around above you, they may appear to fall out of the sky. I think that many of the stories of frogs falling from the sky can probably be explained by conventional reasons. In other words, they can probably be explained simply by the natural breeding migrations of adults moving into ponds en masse and possibly young individuals leaving ponds en masse, rather than any other curious phenomena that we don't understand. Just when I'm satisfied that I have some answers, one of the immutable laws of my mysterious universe comes into play. Solve one mystery, and there's always another to remind us that we don't have all the answers and probably never will. Seattle, Washington. In this city are the laboratories where a farmer from out of town hopes to find the answer to a problem which has mystified her. Dottie Hearn has been troubled ever since she found tiny globules of goo covering her farm buildings and land. She hopes that a small sample she froze will yield its secrets to the scientists. Are there any birds that you have in the area that may have flown over and dropped some feces? I have birds, but I haven't seen any feces. And what, what exactly are we looking at, the liquid? Or uh, there's what, uh, there's little at? tiny blobs in there. They're crystal clear. Is this one yeah. that we're looking at here? Yes, with the, uh -huh. that's one. The little white one? Uh -huh. To try to determine what this is, we can look for E. coli, which mm -hmm. is a bacteria that's found in the intestinal tract of warm animals. We should have the results in about two days. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you. Dottie Hearn knows every acre and every tree on her farm near the Oregon border. I keep a daily log. Been doing this for years, and it's about the life on the farm and anything that happens about the weather and so on and so forth. Well, this is about August 7th, and on this day, it began to rain about 3 p.m., and after the rain had stopped, I put the dogs out. I found a gelatin-like substance on top of the wood box. It was clear and in chunks. Sunny, my daughter, went out and scooped up some into a plastic bag. Also, there was blobs in other places, too. It was everywhere. It was on the grass. It was on the floor of the porch. It was on the hand railings. The reason I keep mentioning the wood box is because it showed up the most there. It was soft and gelatinous. It was clear. There was no color to it or odor. The blobs cropped up again on Dottie Hearn's farm several days later. By now, even more puzzled, she decided to approach the government for help. One possible cause was suggested by the Pentagon. The military and Air Force and Navy have said that the practice bombing out at sea, 10 to 25 miles out, they said they blasted a school of jellyfish sky high. We are about 50 miles from the ocean. The jellyfish thing sounds a little far-fetched. At the laboratories, the scientists have spent two days testing the goo. Dottie Hearn is about to get some answers. Hi, Tim. Hello, Dottie. What did you find out? Well, uh, this is our control plate. And as you can see, the colonies are, the E. coli colonies are the shiny green colonies on this plate. This is our control plate, like I said. And this is your sample. As you can see, there aren't any uh, bacteria on this plate at all. So at this point, uh, we've determined that it is not associated with uh, birds or bird droppings. That's the conclusion that we've come to right. with this test. The goo has also been tested under the microscope. There is debris in there. It's unrecognizable. We, we can't distinguish exactly what it was originally. I think the freezing may be at fault. Um, it, it seems that it's, it's caused decomposition. Um, as far as identifying it goes, um, it, it is not possible with what we re have received. We would need a better sample. For now, Dottie's sample goes into cold storage, but not the problem itself. She's determined that one day she will find out just where the mysterious goo came from. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. If somebody else would have told me about this, I don't think I would have believed them. I'm as baffled as I could be about it. 
I guess the mystery still goes on. Accrington in the north of England enjoys the reputation of being a down-to-earth industrial Lancashire town. But one night the place played host to the strangest visitation from the heavens. It was a very quiet, still night. I was awakened by this strange noise, and then I heard it on top of the roof, thudding, frightening thudding noise. So I put my dressing gown on and came downstairs, opened the front door, and there was nothing there. When I went to the back door, uh, all these apples was coming down. As far as I could see, they were just coming straight from the sky. <laughs> That's all I heard. In pre oh, I was staring at the velocity they were coming out. I, nothing coming from a great height to gather the momentum they were coming at. It was bouncing off the shed all over the place. And I was just terrified, just watching this for ages. And it was that fright. I, I shut the window sharp. I, I, I had feelings and visions of them coming through the pain at me. But it carried on falling, falling, and falling. It just went on for two hours. The Haythorn Whites were so terrified they spent the rest of the night awake and fearful. When dawn broke, they realised just what the fusillade of fruit had brought into their lives. When we came out in the morning, I've never seen nothing like it. There were so many apples in the garden. I just couldn't understand where they'd come from. And there were just a few in the next doors but it bounced and they were just littered, peppered all over. Really ankle deep. I had to wade through them myself to get through them. It was embedded in the garden, eight to ten inches deep. But you realise I've landscaped the garden since. God, there must be hundreds under there somewhere, probably rotted away by now. Across the way, their neighbour, Joan Cork, had also been woken up by the avalanche of apples. I heard this noise. It was a thud. Thud, thud, and I thought, somebody digging. And so I got out of bed and I came to this window and I pinpointed it as coming from Adrian's over there. And I thought, what on earth is she doing now? Is she having a party <laughs> at this time of the night? Because it was about half past one. After listening to the barrage for half an hour, Joan went back to bed. The next morning, she rushed to investigate. At the shock of my life. Apples? There seemed to be thousands of them. <laughs> they were all in her garden. But only in her garden. And uh, there were Bramleys, there were Coxes. Some were whole, some were embedded. I've never, never come across anything like that before. And it was a bit frightening, you know. The Haythorn Whites have spent long hours racking their brains about that strange and terrifying night. It was long past the apple harvest. There was no apple tree for miles around. They're still mystified by the baffling bombardment. It could have been a wind what brought them, but it wasn't windy that night or it wasn't raining. And there was no aircraft recorded at that particular time in the morning. So we just, just couldn't understand where they come from. I've heard of a lot of things, but seeing is actually believing. And um, I'll never forget it. There must be an explanation, a logical explanation, but uh, who knows?